So welcome everybody to this panel around uh, with different peoples from different organizations and associations on the topic collecting computer history at the Vintage Computing Festival 22. Now, um, I want to first start with the introduction round, like about what kind of museums we have here, collectors, peoples, and what kind of elements. Later, I want to talk with you a little bit about the topic, how do actually those different actors collaborate with each other. And finally, I want to go to the topic, so actually, what does it mean collecting computer history? What should we collect? What can we forget or what shouldn't be forgotten? What kind of tactics those different groups and associations have within? We also will invite you then to discuss with us. This is the chair here then, if somebody wants to add something, because what I personally believe is that many of us already collected it by themselves, have histories and stories about telling that to discuss with us. So now the first round, a quick brief introduction. I'm going to ask everybody of you telling quickly about what kind of museum collection initiative you are, what are you doing, what are you collecting, what are you not collecting in a way, and uh, a little bit more so people know about your initiative. I propose I start first with the tab on the left. Let's see who's that. And that's Esokop. Stefania, please introduce you to your topic and your association. Hello, hello everybody. I am Stefania Calcagno, president of European Society for Computer Preservation. Uh, we are a, a free association made by a bunch, created by a bunch of retro computers addicted in uh, seven, eight, eight years ago uh, from Germany, Italy, and Switzerland. We are based in Switzerland, but we have also members in Italy and Germany. Uh, we have as a mission to preserve, maintain, and restore the history of computers and to teach the new generations how we got from a huge computer making two plus two in five minutes to have uh, all the m knowledge of mankind on the on your hand in a smartphone and also <clears throat> to provide uh, the all uh, the collectivity for documentation and from informations in order to let everybody be able to uh, repair, fix, and restore, and maintain active and uh, usable old computers. And just a question for you, what are you collecting and what are you not collecting? As an association, <laughs> uh, we are collecting machines mainly from 97, 1965 to 1995, but we also have some uh, stuff from uh, just after the Second World War, such as uh, IBM punches and other stuff from 1945-47. Okay, thanks. So let's go to the next group, and I think that's the Musée Bolo in uh, Lausanne, I think, are you stationed? So please introduce yourself and go ahead, Cedric. Okay, many thanks. So I am Cedric Godin, president of the Foundation Memoir Informatique, who owns the collection of the Musée Bolo. It's a huge collection, started 26 years ago, and uh, we collect, um, again, today, really rare computers. Uh, we have a lot of Commodore 64, Amigas, and so on. And uh, the, today in the collection, we, the storage is, uh, the, the, the space of the storage is uh, quite full, so we collect only really interesting things. So if you have uh, some uh, really interesting computers, we still continue to collect, but uh, not, um, not a common one. We have a, a lot. Most of the time, we give some to the OCCC when we don't. Uh, we have already this computer, so we give the, the contact to the OCCC so that they, uh, they can increase their collections. So. And we have an uh, exhibition at uh, EPFL where you can show only a small part, a really small part of the collection, 3%. And we make a lot of uh, visit guided tour for the, uh, the students and the children and also the, the, the people. Yeah. Thanks, Cedric. I think it's now the next step is going again to the left for you, René, to the Swiss digitization project. You collect something else. Yes, I'm coming more from the game technology side and normally I'm a game designer at the University of the Arts 
and there we collect just a side note, we collect also game consoles and uh, normal games. There we collect also especially bad games to show students how a bad game is made and not only the good games. But I'm here for, uh, with SwissDigitization.ch. We search oral history because one of the problems today, we see it out there, we have artifacts, these are clear, they are there. But one of the biggest problem with the digitalization transformation is to have the things that uh, are in everyday's life, what changed and what is different and how our society changed. So there we search for images. There are not so many images from this time because it was not worth to make a photo if it's one franc, for example. And uh, we search there people who are talking about what they are talking or writing about what they have learned, see in the last 40 years. Thanks, Rene. And now I go to the OCC Computer Club, Stefan. Um, and yeah, it loads at the moment. So please explain what are you doing, what are you collecting? Okay, thank you. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Stefan Pitlou. I'm the president of the OCCC. OCCC stands for All Computer and Consoles Club. We are a club in the French part of Switzerland. We are based in Martigny. This is in Valais. Uh, we are all French speaking people here. I think you didn't miss us. <laughs> um, yeah, the OCCC was granted five years ago uh, for me and three other friends because we had a constat uh, once we remarked that we don't have the possibility, we don't have the opportunity to actually use our computers. We all have many computers somehow at, ho at home, but we didn't have the opportunity to plug them all and to try them. And then we thought maybe it'd be a good idea to make some exposition, some booths, to make this comput uh, computer uh, usable and to show them to the public home. And here we go. What we did is once a year, we make an exposition in Martini. This is always the first weekend of June uh, with a free entrance where we expose each year uh, with a new thema, some computers, about 50 computers that everybody can use, touch and play with them. This is really the main goal of the, of the association is to have those computer preserved and exposed to the public. Uh, we collect mainly computers, but we have some other people in the association that collect consoles too, hence the name. And actually, we have a pretty another organization that um, other group that we have here. Actually, every member of the group own his own collection. We don't have uh, some material that uh, belong to the club itself, but instead everybody has his own collection. Therefore, we have special we are specialized in many different aspects. For example, I'm more an Amiga guy. I'm collecting uh, everything that's just the Amiga. But we have other people like Marcel that you serve with the Amiga 3000 or other that is specialized in Unix system. He's mainly interested in everything that touch Unix. And we have other people that are specialized, for example, in PlayStation 2. So we have a very large panel of uh, different kind of machine. Actually, we are about um, 40 people in the group. And we have more than uh, 300 machines ready to be shown to be used by the public. What we do mainly is to collect some computers, to restore them, to save them. Uh, we always try to restore them the most accurately way possible to have a display that matches the accuracy of the history. And the last thing that we want to do always is to preserve the, the software that's come with in a digital form because we all know that uh, later those uh, diskettes and software won't be available anymore. This is it. Yeah, so thanks. So we know we have really different angles on the same topic. Now, one topic which you also see outside here, everybody has just a table, but has a huge collection. The same happens also for museums. They have a huge collection, but maybe only a small exhibition room. So my question to you is, uh, how do you cope with this tension between having a lot of stuff, having a lot of stuff and maintaining, but only be able to show small stuff out of it? And then the other question, then somebody else can also answer that. Are there any stuff you which you'd have loved to have shown but never showed it to somebody and why? So on, on that question. Okay. So, um, well, why we show only a small portion of the collection is quite simple. It's because of the financing. You need money to finance uh, a museum. 
to have professionals that take care of objects. And today our museum is uh, only uh, fully run by volunteers. So uh, it's uh, really complicated to run a museum by volunteer because you have a real job in your life and the second job is the museum. So you spend a lot, a lot of time for the museum. And uh, at the beginning, the collection was quite small, so it was quite easy. But as soon as the collection becomes bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more complicated to manage all the collections and also to take care of the objects. And uh, uh, one moment in time, you need to, to, take, uh, to say, OK, now we need to select what we want to collect first, to select also objects that we want to keep for preservation, to show, to have uh, an exhibition, for example, a nice object to show, and some object also to make them running again, to see uh, to the people the experience you can have with computer, with the software also, because the software is invisible. If you don't have, sometimes you have emulators, but it's not really the same as the original computer. Sometimes you need really the real computers first to do the emulator that is quite close to the computers and to also to experience the way the people used uh, the computer and to understand the way it was used and the working, in fact. So this is also, oh, there is also a historical perspective behind this object. You have also the history behind each object. If you think about the Depra mouse, you have a, a whole history of, uh, of Swiss computing behind this small mouse, this small object. And uh, there is people uh, that need to tell this story today because they are still alive. And uh, yeah, so there is a lot of, uh, of work as a museum to do. And uh, we need to do choice. So maybe it's better to collect today the the témoignage of people that tell the story about certain object made in Switzerland, for example, uh, and uh, yeah, so yeah, there is some choice to do. And what, how you respond on that? Do you have also this issue? I think one of the issues is always if you want to have uh, everybody knows in here to have something playable. In our case, a game or something then the thing is that it can be broken. So if you would put everything out there, then 50% would be broken. For example, we had uh, uh, Amiga made as a company first um, uh, Atari 2600 board where you can balance. And we bought one, of course, and it was very funny. And we exhibited it once and then it was <laughs> crashed. And so I think this is also one of the problems. Uh, also, if you have a lot of stuff uh, that you have always two or three computers working or consoles. And I think this is also one of the problems. This question about is it playable, interactive, or is it just something you can look at? Well, uh, we have two topics to talk about. Uh, the first topic is Old computers got crashing. They, not always, but sometimes, poof, explode. Okay, so to exhibit them always is quite difficult, if not impossible, because they, they can't live forever. So we have to choose whenever, and wherever, and where to exhibit those computers. And the second topic is that we like to tell stories. We don't exhibit a computer showing that computer, no. It's environment where it was used. We have here an Atari playing music like a music studio in the 90, 1990. We have, uh, uh, two months ago, made a, a real BBS connected to a PSTN network showing the people and trying to, 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 to give them the same feeling we had when we sent an email before internet four days to deliver the email from Switzerland to London. And uh, to tell these stories, there is a huge work. And uh, as Bolo said, we are almost volunteers. There is no money in this business. It's not a business at all. <laughs> it's, it's a business for others. We, we spend our money to let these machines survive. So uh, we have, uh, I think, all everybody the same problems. And 
Was unten? <laughs> Stefan? Ja. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, from the perspective of the OCCC, it's a, a little bit other story. I told you further that so my goal is to uh, organize once a year an exhibition in Martini where we show all computers to the people, to the attendees. And what we do is that we choose a theme. Uh, once we did uh, Atari, Atari story. Another time we did uh, the Apple history when Apple was 40 years. Uh, another time we did uh, Back to the Future because we remarked that there was many games on many platforms based on Back to the Future. And once we choose the theme, then we decide what computer will be prepared for this theme. And we have about six, seven, eight months to focus on those computers to make them usable, prepare them, and hopefully that they don't burn when we turn them on. <laughs> That's the main problem, as you said. Uh, this is one part of the, um, of the dilemma. The second part is when we are going outside in other exhibition, like here, maybe, and then we have to pick up something that we have in working state because it is not uh, interesting to show something that doesn't work. Uh, that's why we mainly try to choose a team uh, and to choose which people from the club come with which machine that is chosen. For example, this time we took the, um, the V-Box with us because we just reserved this machine and we took this is a good idea to show it in a working condition because it's now finished. It took us about uh, one month to prepare it, to make it uh, ready to go ready to live. And yeah, the other problematic, as you said, for the storage, well, we solved this in another way. As I said, each uh, team member, each people in the OCCC <coughs> has his own collection. And therefore, a big part of the collection is hosted at home to the people. We have still a uh, two storage solution too in Martini, where we, we let to most precious pieces, some computers that really have to be cared about. And we have um, a, nice, uh, a nice storage solution that is um, uh, without humidity and uh, without light. So we can really uh, store a computer without having problem with them in many years. That's it. Now, um, this was like the introduction a little bit. Now I want to go more into the collaboration because we have really different actors. We have, as you see, we have over 30 or 35 exhibitors, many privately collecting. Then we have more, a li little bit the museum approach. And um, this is a vibrant community. We have museums. So my question is, it, how are they related to each other? Do they work together? How do they work well together? What's going on between this kind of community with over 800 participants actually at the moment visiting them versus museums and other stuff? So we are collaborating with the collector because at the beginning the museum was a collection, so he started with a collector. So if Bolognini started his collection 26 years ago, as I said, so he was a collector at the, at the origin. It's, and when they decided to, uh, to apply for a museum, uh, they, they decided because they have a lot, the collection was too big, and they said it would be nice to uh, tell the story of the CES computer, to have some, uh, to turn on some of the CES computer for the history and to, to understand how they work. And uh, it started slowly uh, like that. And there is a small team around the, the collection started to play with the computers a bit like the, the OCCC was uh, doing today. And uh, slowly we, we turn on a certain number of uh, computers. And, but we said we should also keep some for the, the preservation to keep the, the, the object, uh, to have a nice object to show. And this is object, and also her object. So there is rare computer in the collection that you don't want somebody to break the computer. And that's maybe uh, yeah, the fear of the collectors sometimes. So Eve give us his trust to, to play with his computer. So this was uh, something quite great. And uh, 20 years after, it's a museum uh, with a big collection and that we need to manage. So, and, uh, Actually, the, the collaboration with OCCC, we did some, uh, some um, we came sometimes to the Oof Party and uh, we uh, sent them some people that want to give computers that we have enough in our collection. So we sent the contact to the collectors because we, we think that it's good that somebody can collect this as computer even if we have too much. 
uh, if uh, they, they don't have some models, maybe it's a good idea that they, they keep this as models. Instead, uh, the people just throw away this as computer, some dates from uh, 70s, 80s, and just throw them away. So this is just a pity. So yeah. You want to add on that? Because you told me a little bit you were sometimes working with museums or else. Uh, well, no, sorry, I don't understand very well uh, your question. Uh, like you want to add to this, like the collaboration with museums, you told yeah, me. Yeah. But, okay. Uh, I thought it was another question for me, yeah. not the same one, <laughs> so, but I was. Okay, no, no, the same question. Well, uh, se several ways uh, we, we collaborate each other, uh, any association, uh, any, but also private people give an end uh, if they can. I will tell something about Ticino. We have uh, uh, in Ticino two associations. We are uh, maybe the most known because we are older, but the other one is Astizi, which is run by ex uh, um, USI, uh, University of Italian Switzerland members, and SUPSI, the Scuola Superiore della Universitaria della Svizzera Italiana. And uh, ex, for example, we, they had a, a PDP 11 and a list machine, which were not working anymore and they gave us in order to be restored and our volunteers tried to restore those machine for them and so on we but mainly uh, between all of us we share knowledge we share contacts <laughs> occc <laughs> uh, we, we were we were sharing something just five minutes before starting this uh, interview this uh, round table and we share all knowledge about machines uh, manuals uh, and everything and sometimes also spare parts with uh, Musibolo, <laughs> we gave uh, each other uh, hard disks or whatever when something crashes because we have maybe three, four and they don't or they have a lot and we don't have. So uh, also because we are volunteers, we have to collaborate and we are keeping up a sheen which uh, wants to maintain life and in, in the memory of the people, uh, the history of informatics and how it is possible to do it without collaborate is impossible. So we have to, and we like, we love to. You want to add something, Stefan, or? Um, yeah, like uh, Cedric said, um, we are uh, really kind, really happy to be collaborating with uh, the Musée Bolo. Uh, there are some times when we did the help, uh, for example, for the Smacky, uh, they lend us some pieces uh, that we can use on the computer to make them ready to run again or to make them displayable. And uh, they help us with the basis of the knowledge because they have knowledge on this computer and they help us to understand how the computer functions. And I must say, um, we at the OCCC find very important that the collab collaboration is possible because at the end, this is a hobby for us and everyone has to be happy for the outcome. Uh, I should add something that many members of the OCCC are members of the Bolos Museum too. That means there is some, uh, some relativity between those organizations and it, it will remain so. So it feels like there's a huge harmony in between <laughs> the different entities. So I just want to ask, are there also sometimes challenges? Because what we see here, what I see is all computer museums seems to be voluntary organized. But we also have professional museums or other stuff. How's the collaboration going on with them? Like, uh, or, or other stuff? Or is, is it really all, everything is harmony? Also there's one interesting thing. You see the Swiss Romo and you see the Swiss uh, German. And, and also, oh, oh God, oh God. The, let's, let's, let's say it like this, the Latin Switzerland and the German part of Switzerland. And I have a little bit feeling that the feeling that in the German part it's working differently, I think, because uh, there are not so many museums. And I have, have also the feeling that the public museums are not very interested in computers, technology and games. So as my opinion. And, and it's also, I think, a different mindset in the German part. Their computer is still something that it's or the past. Therefore, uh, with the collaboration, I think it's not so simple for the German part of Switzerland. 
Mm, yes, so the collaboration even for the Swiss French part or the with the Swiss Italian is not so an so easy task. So it needs a lot of discussion on the, about different subjects. We are, we are the, uh, sometimes it's we are not we don't always agree together. So we need to talk uh, to find a common ground to work together. This is not so easy. So but it's f it's possible. So I, I would say there is no talk in Switzerland, in the German part of Switzerland about these things at the moment. As I, I think it's another stage of collaborating because in the Swiss part it's more no collaboration at all. But this is just my opinion, eh, to be honest. Eh? Also I made an uh, exhibition with Swiss games from 2008 on and we were the most of the time alone in the darkness. But therefore I think it's really a difference. Of course, it's not simple, you know. That's yeah, but, but let's give me an example. What was not simple? So, so we have a little bit more specific feeling. So, so what was it about? Specific feelings. No, no, no. <laughs> like always saying just special or difficult. I, I want to have specific examples so so we can understand what was it about. We 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 collaborate and we love to collaborate. Okay. So. So maybe because we are Latins, don't know, but we are always guests at the OCCC, it's a, a lot of years we go, so. Um, as I told in the beginning, we have a chair here for somebody adding something. We are at the topic now, relationship between museums and private collectors and all those people collecting. So if you want to add something, this chair is free, uh, it's yeah, it's quite the nice chair. Just add it and, and add to the panel because we want to make a little bit of discussion about it. So it's from this round on. So does somebody want to take up the chair and add something to the debate on the harmony between museums, collectors, and other initiatives? Yeah, then ask you. No, if I, I just would like to take my, my personal that's okay. That's okay. okay. Uh, since I'm a collector, <laughs> also, <laughs> uh, I'm maybe the most uh, important collector of Commodore stuff in the world. I have uh, almost everything. Everything, which means the first prototype and the last prototype. And every computer box is perfect in my room. My Commodore room is wonderful. And it's totally different between the, collect the collection of European Society for Computer Preservation, because as a, an association, as a museum, we have to show people the environment in which the machine worked, not the machine itself, not the box, has no meaning for computer, European Society, the box of a computer. For a pri private collector, as I am on the other side, the box is wonderful. <laughs> so we have a big difference. Uh, from uh, appliances and devices collected by private collectors and appliances and devices collected by museums. That should be a point. I don't know if you want to, to add something. Yeah, I can, I can add something. Um, uh, as you said, Cedric, the, co the collaboration is good in the, 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 the whole picture, but sometimes there is some point where we don't agree. And this is logical too, because you're a museum, we are collectors. I, I just think that the, the main information is that the main goal for everybody is the same. We want to preserve all computers, we want to make them available for the future, for our children, for the people that come after us to, be, to continue to be able to use them and to understand them. But sometimes there are some points where we don't agree and we simply have sometimes to agree to disagree. The main problem is to accept to do that and uh, just have to discuss and to make it happen. But I think we are all uh, growth enough yet to, to be able to do that without, without fight. Without fight. Do you want to add something? Other? Well, and afterwards we go to the next topic. Yeah. So when you are a collector, one, you have a big collection, one day you realize that one day you will die and your collection will go away. And uh, at the museum, we receive a lot of computers from collectors that are quite old because they want their collection to be preserved for a long time. 
but this is a challenge for a museum. But uh, this is the relation uh, collector have with the collection. This is really the, the baby, so they want to keep their baby. They, they collected things for years, and they want that the collection survive to them. And sometimes the museum is made for that, maybe. But it's difficult for us because we have volunteers. So one moment in time, we need to have a finance, man, well, a finance and to build a big storage and so on, like uh, with Hunter. But it's really difficult to reach that goal. And then to make the museum working. This is the other point, so yeah. Great, so if nobody takes the chair, we're gonna move on to the next topic, building on your topic. Now, if you collect stuff, what you see here a lot in this uh, exhibition, you see many devices, you see smaller devices on those elements. And what I would like to discuss now, so what should we preserve actually from this history of computing? You mentioned it a little bit in the beginning, Rene. Well, what is worth to be collected? What is worth not to be collected? And uh, what, what should we preserve from this history of the last 100 years actually computing uh, for the future? So what is worth to be reserved? It's actually a pretty hard question because I think that at some point everything is worth to be collected. But if you have to put some priorities, then I will say that the most important thing is the software. Because without the software, we can, you can do anything with a computer. It's a nice display things. It's nice to say that you have some prototype, but if you don't have anything to make uh, able to run on it, then it's worthless. Naturally, there is some exception, that's clear, but uh, I will say that the main topic for me, the most urgent one, is to save the softwares because the, um, the floppy disk, the tapes, everything that holds the software become old, and uh, we will come to a point in a few years when it won't be possible anymore to save them. Uh, on the machine front, I think that uh, yeah, somebody has to 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 check how rare a machine is. Uh, I think if you take uh, two uh, examples that we have now on the booth for what we have today, we have a B-Box, we have an Amiga 3000, we have a Smacky. Well, if I have to choose one of those three, it's clearly the Smacky that have to be preserved. I'm sorry for the B-Box because the B-Box you can. Uh, basically find one in, in US, you can find one in France, you can find, it won't be easy for sure, but you can find one. Uh, in contrario, you won't be able to find a SPACI 6, 6 unless you are pretty lucky because the Musée Bolo is the only one that has this collection. We have some too, but not as big as a real collection. And if someone tells you have to throw this away, uh, then uh, it's be, it can be dangerous. And the Amiga, well, you can find an Amiga everywhere, so <laughs> it doesn't come into the question. But ideally, I won't throw any away. I want to hold them all and solve them all. That's clear, yeah? Uh, I was not totally agree with you can find an Amiga everywhere, because you know that there is one Amiga that <laughs> you can't find it's anywhere. An it's a Sky Inception. Yeah, 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 it should be. <laughs> Actually, I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You, you, you are totally right. And... We, uh, we we have, uh, for example, uh, some computers like uh, Sun uh, Enterprise 10,000, uh, 10, which weighs about 1,500 kilos, and it was saved from uh, being destroyed in a, a data center in Sardinia Island in the Mediterranean, and it was very difficult to to reach that place and to take a 1,500 kilos computer to Lugano. It's not that easy. Uh, and that's a point. Uh, we, we would like to save those computer, uh, those stuff, because no private collector can. And also if private collectors then leave to museums like Bolo, uh, their collection, uh, they won't ever have a Sun Star, Starfire because it's impossible to have at home. So we are trying to save those kind of computers, um, which made the history, which made the history of informatics, of internet, and we try to save also uh, the informations inside. I mean, uh, the content of certain hard disks or uh, the dump of APROM and ROMs of the computers 
because as the floppy disk, as the tapes, they have a finished lifetime, and we, we try to, to, to preserve the contents too. Thanks, and on your side, Rune, what should be preserved and what not? Also, we have a Vectrex out there. Up, oh, This is our Vectrex on the things. And uh, the first thing is, I think it's important also to collect what people are talked about these computers, what is around, what was the culture it was embedded. And I think this thing we can collect with uh, YouTube videos and things like this. But I'm also to the question what we should, also in this area we can collect everything that is there because it's just data and data is storable. But of course the other thing, how the interaction works and so on, therefore I'm a little bit uh, in the position to say we should collect that we can in the future tell another story than the classic positivistic mainstream story we tell today about games. You know? And I think this is important. Therefore, we should have also this other type of, of um, uh, game, uh, computers or games that didn't work like the mainstream model, so that we are clear there is another thing than just we had Amiga C64 and so on. Model, because this is, to be honest, a little bit on a two-day views on this, it's the mainstream model, was the mainstream on those, in those days. But there were a lot of different hardwares that are, uh, as the Smacky, for example, showing something else. You know? It was not the classic uh, democratizing via privatizing. It was something else. You know? Therefore, as an example, there is the, everybody knows Plato systems. It's a very important thing you have to look at. It was an e-learning system from 68, and as a game designer or as a coder, I go up there and look into a system that had on uh, 72 things. Ne you don't find it somewhere else. So it's really you go in there and you see the first person shoot long ago before everybody. And I think this is important to, to have this wide range of what was possible and not a small thing. Therefore, I'm for collecting also a lot. But if we have to decide at the end, <laughs> I would be the one of the side who would say, I would take the vec tracks and uh, Plato, because it shows much more than a lot of other culture. Just saying that I love Vectrex too. So one thing, Vectrex is not like all vector screen out there is not emulatable. Order. It's not something you can show. The first time in my life I saw asteroids, and you see the cathodic array in the middle. It's as bright as the whole screen. You say fuck, and all this emulation don't show anything of this. So the, even the sound is so dramatic, good on this machine, and this is not, um, yeah, emulate even not with FPGA. No, sorry. I can add something. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, what is important to preserve for us? We may we have made a, uh, a choice. So Swiss computers, because this is local. Uh, we have Professor Witt and Professor Jean-Daniel Nicou, who both made computers, uh, even uh, some others, and we need to preserve this, this is history, uh, the history behind this is computers and the, the part of the computers, even the computers. I think this is quite important, and uh, also with the help of collectors, because there is some people uh, making uh, Lilith, working back again, so this is a quite great work. And we have also uh, uh, rare computers, like Cray computers, which we will maybe, it will be difficult to put back again to life because this is really complicated computers and this is really rare computers. I think this is the, the, two, um, the two main objects we need to preserve for a long time. And for the software, it's important to preserve the software because it's just, uh, if you think about of the software of the 80s, I think today in uh, one USB key, you can have uh, maybe the, the software of all the world in one key. I think it should not be impossible. And uh, yeah, and the media are not really stable. The magnetic media and the, the, the transistor-based media are not really stable over the time. So we need to preserve the same things and also the documentation because uh, the paper turned to disappear 
and uh, to uh, digitalize the paper also it's sometimes it's a good idea to share the information so yeah okay hey, thanks now again question to the audience are there any questions to them you only have to take the seat uh, on this collecting what should be collected or not collected Because many of you are collectors themselves, um, like you in the middle. <laughs> I have no questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would be worthwhile to have? What would be worthwhile to have is a. Uh, oh, no, I have a suggestion. What would be worthwhile to have is a overview of the collections of everybody in Switzerland, uh, some sort of spreadsheet with the different collectors with the machines they have. Because there are some very rare machines that collectors have and that's not known about. For instance, on data point 2200 to Frank will not get. <laughs> Things like that are very rare, important, and it would be good to have an overview of uh, what's available in the collectors and not only in the So how do you reply, is this existing or why doesn't it exist? Because you have your association, your association, and you and you all harmonize, but you don't have an overview. Or is, it, or is there a list already, or what hinders us to build this list? I think the suggestion is very good, but the main problem is, I know, for example, for the Musée Bolo, it's not yet doable because they first have to make a list on what they have, because they have so many computers each time I go in there, I discover something new. I mean, it's not so an easy task to test an Excel list until I have this, 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 and this. Uh, even if I take a simple example for the, um, uh, the pets, the Commodore pet, you have, I don't know, about 30 different Commodore pets, and each one is different because each one is a kind of uh, specification that's different from the other one. I personally, as collector, have two pets. And I think it's already enough for the place that I have, because uh, otherwise my wife will kill me. This is another topic. <laughs> but you know, yeah, for sure, it's a good idea, but um, it's not so easy. Even for us in the OCCC, as I told uh, further, each one, each member has his one collection. I have a listing for the one I have. Uh, I'm not sure that every member has one. But this is something that we have to do and something we want to create. And I think maybe it could be a good topic maybe for the next year to bring this on the table to begin with. Uh, then come the possibility uh, to, to, to make the differentiation what you want to list. Because if you want to list everything that you have, then you need a, a big Excel list. You have to choose what you want, you know? But yeah, DD is good. Is it? I, I add one thing. If you see on our site, there is the list of all the computers we preserve, divided by producer and or, or um, other trees. But we have about 4,000 computers, and you find 690 something more or less different models. It's quite hard to enter the real difference between a model and another one. And another thing, as Stefan correctly said, you have to choose what to list. Uh, we tried to list our software. After weeks of work, we got maybe the 2% of, of the job done, and we decided, OK, let's do it later. So it's very hard. OK, so there is a struggle with your whole list on that topic. Um, now I want to go back to one topic you started to discuss a little bit. Uh, that's the topic, OK, history is often told now to the back, and it changes over time. Uh, OK, your statement quickly, and then afterwards I want to, you have to sit there. There is no standing. <laughs> is that cable that short? Well, anyway, uh, I think the problem Jos just uh, um, touched is something very more deeply. Uh, the basic thing about having a collection for a museum is not to collect this stuff. It is not to have that stuff. 
It is not to preserve that stuff. It is had to have a huge sufficient repository of tools to build their exhibition. I'm a collector. I got a few computers and the, the real worth of my collection is if I do an exhibition, I don't have to run around in the world and beg people to get a specific computer which I need to explain a specific point in the exhibition. I just go into my warehouse and pick one of them. Except, and that is maybe part of what he asked is, there are very few but important machines I'm missing. I'm begging him for now four years or what to lend me his data point 2200. Not sure if you mentioned that. Because <laughs> uh, that is one computer I'm missing and we're right now building an exhibition about the history of the PC, how the PC came to be. And in the history of the PC, the data point is an interesting, well, data point, because of being the first step in what later became the x86 architecture. So it belongs into the timeline we're building, and I don't have one. And that is maybe the idea about the list. It is not about having all of your stuff down to the last cassette, down to the last floppy disk inventory, but rather having uh, an overview to help among each other to fin find um, items for exhibitions when we need them. Because the next time one of you is doing an exhibition about, I don't know, about the history of Smacky and you need a single board computer, with a Z80, which has been used during development or whatever. I don't know, you got more ideas than I'd have. So there's a huge difference between collecting and museum. Also, maybe going back to another point, the view of the collector is having more stuff. I know it, I am a collector. I love having more stuff. And there's just one thing to satisfy a collector, which is, again, more, more, more stuff, yeah? Which is completely different from my view as a professional for doing a show, doing a museum. Because here I don't want to have more stuff, I want to have the right stuff. Yeah? And on the interface between museum and collector, we have a clash of culture. Because the collector really loves his tiny little 64. This is a piece of his heart. I, as a museum, but also as a larger collector, see this C64 not as a piece of heart. I see it as a source to pick out a SID chip, which is like stabbing that collector into his heart. But we have to see the difference between a professional viewpoint and a collector viewpoint. And this brings a lot of tension between these groups and within these groups. Yeah, of course, sometimes when I'm serious and honest to people giving me stuff, I don't really get the reaction I should get. Yeah, so all this is a very, very different area which we simply mix up with collecting museums and so on. It is totally different viewpoints, totally different areas, and a lot of tension between these areas. And we need ways to overcome it. So, and I'm gone. Yeah, yeah thanks. So we had now this discussion about museum collectors and different views. Now, really, I don't want to pick up your topic again, and that's the one, like, History is also telling stories, stories from different angles. And you mentioned it a little bit, it was a little bit also the engineering story, coming from which processor to which story. There could be also the velocity story, getting faster, or the distribution story, more people get it. Now my question is, but there are also the gaming story, children playing games. What kind of stories didn't we yet tell about computer history? Like there's the story about what was the role of women within computing? What was the role for other stuff? What other stories could we tell which are not so well told about the computer history story, like aspects of it? 
I had someone, I made an interview down uh, up there with a guy who said, yes, I was not so in this digitalization. And then I start and he told, yeah, I was a chemie laborant. I don't know what's a chemie laborant. Yeah, someone worked in chemistry. He then get to the ETH and uh, worked on the Lilith with the graphics font and so on. And then started to have an own company making uh, uh, software solutions for uh, building houses and things like this. And this guy said he was not in digitalization. No? You see the point? The problem is they were all in digitalization. digitalization. And if you look at the Swiss game design scene out there, there were all crackers and worked, uh, made games, and then uh, this ended, and then they are CTO at the moment at search.ch and things like this. I think this is a one point, this having um, Vita, also the, what, you ha what your life was about, because this is also something that tells a lot about this whole thing. This would be one point of me, also, which I found very important. What happens with people when they are there? What happens afterwards? I think this is also something that is very important about digitalization and with how, which machines they work. If we talk, talk about Next, how important was Next for the uh, World Wide Web? It was important. How important was it for the gaming industry? Uh, Doom was first programmed in, for example. Oh, and this is ma uh, machine focused, and the other one was person focused. Well, <clears throat> I personally, I, I'm talking about personal stuff right now. <clears throat> I love to tell the story of how digital art was born. Uh, I did it here some, some years ago. And for example, uh, nobody knows that from video games come the digital art we have right now. We have NFT art uh, and everything, uh, looking on the movies, the special effects and everything was born in computers in early 80s and late 80s with the machine, with people uh, creating stuff. And we have also visitors here working for big companies like NVIDIA or um, Activision making uh, uh, the cards which uh, let people now play on the PlayStation or, or on the PC. And they were born in uh, on certain computers making certain things, certain stuff. and. Nobody knows that, not, no, not, well, not nobody, because a lot of people knows, but just the bunch of people inside that kind of, uh, of groups, uh, but not the public. And this is a story we like, I like to, to talk about. Uh, it's not maybe uh, related just to the collection, it's personal related as he told, it's important to divide the two things, machine related or person related. This is maybe more persons related, but also in a certain um, timing and a certain manner, it, it become from uh, using a Commodore 64 to uh, making a Pixar, <laughs> something like that. Okay. Um. Yeah, the, the way we tell some stories when we do some exhibition with computers is something that we partic particularly care, take care about. Uh, when we do an annual exposition in Martini, the first thing that we do is to choose a theme. And then we try to, to stay in focus with this theme. Uh, I take two examples that we do. The first one, this was last year with Back to the Future. Once we told, uh, we told us it could be a good idea to have a real DeLorean in front of the exhibition, so we did. And then we make uh, some exposition with all the computer games uh, that are based on Back to the Future. And this was the whole point of the world exposition. Then we have um, storytelling in the world exposition with movie posters, with uh, some kind of music that run in the background. This was the story behind. And in this particular case, the computer was not the, the main point of the exhibition. Uh, we simply use it back to the future as a line to conduct the, the attendees to show, to show what we have to show them. Uh, second approach that we, to, we take sometimes, it was an, a, a, good example, a good example with the movie um, 
um, Jurassic Park. In this movie, there is a well-known scene uh, where someone used a Macintosh Quadra 700 to hack the system, to shut down the lights, and then on the other side, there was this young girl that used a system on XLISM. Oh, this is a Unix system, I know it. And uh, actually, this software exists. Uh, Marcel uh, installed this software on uh, O2 SGI, and we made a, a whole booth with uh, those both computers presented with the movie in background. And so this was the way we told the story behind those, and it was only um, a way to show the computer to the people. Uh, another time we did totally another way, we make an exposition about Atari. We simply uh, took out all we have on the Atari uh, brand, consoles, computers, games, and uh, there were no big story behind. It was only computer exposed. So yeah, it, the story itself, it's very important. It has to be part of the exposition, but sometimes it's more important than other. Okay. Um, if there is an urgent addition, otherwise I would say we're coming to the end of the panel. And um, just to see the exhibition is ongoing another two hours, so visit those different places you can talk to them for. Um, and um, I would just finish it now. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Chair. <laughs> no, no, I'll ask. <laughs> yeah. I guess many people on a small bike collector, I happen to enjoy small handheld computers. Mm -hmm. um, but they're all in the box in the cellar. And along with a lot of other, what I would call, what I might call computer junk. But one man's junk is another man's treasure. And when I see this out here, how can I, instead of throwing this in the old Here you have the right persons and the discussion how, like one is of course you can come every year here and we of course show them. Uh, and then other was, uh, I, I give the answer to you because you have the whole network on that topic. So uh, generally we accept donations. So you need to contact us with a photo of your, uh, your objects. And then we decide if we uh, we want to keep it or not because we have uh, we miss well we have a, a lot of computers and uh, not enough space so that's the problem and I think uh, the others has the same problem if we don't accept generally we redirect to some other people uh, if they are interested to have uh, this object or not that's the point. No, it's small. Yeah, yeah, it's small. But we have a lot of them. For example, the the Palm uh, computer, we have more than 100 of them. So, um, yeah. And one thing is also something, if you look at, in Switzerland, there are a lot of these local museums. So every town has a local museum. And a lot of, and they normally show 10% of what they have in the background. Order. And each person can uh, also give things to these local museums. And then they have to decide. Order. I'm, I never ask someone of them if also people come by with computers, to be honest. And on the other side, perhaps we have to do this. We have to go there and say, I have this computer, I want to, it's to spend it. Then perhaps in five, ten years they understand that it's also part of their heritage, uh, let's say, job. Or at the moment, of course, it's not because nobody comes. It's clear, everybody of us throw away his Newton and so on. Or and I think this is perhaps something we have to do just to push them to the point to say, we need also to take computers, for example, or handhelds, or games. So at the moment, it's not like this, to be honest. But uh, yeah, administrations are always are often only then reacting if they were really confronted with things like this. We have here in Zurich a guy that had a really big pinball machine archive, really huge. He had everything, and also arcades. And um, he can't do it anymore because it's too expensive. And he tried over years to get room just for this, no chance. And I think this is something we have really to have a lobby to also say always, we want to have room for our digital heritage, 
otherwise and to go on oder and the problem is in switzerland you always say oh i want to do it this but perhaps we have to have a lobby organization for exactly that mm. Um, unfortunately, I have really to stop here, but there is a lot of discussion ongoing here. You, you see their faces, you know, all the people. Many are also collecting here. You could ask people they're collecting personally. And the next talk in here is more about the personal history of uh, Ma Manuel, I think, on the C64, who he wrote the book about his histories on the C64. So now there's the next talk going on here. But thanks a lot for your participation and uh, your questions. <laughs> <laughs>